Hello everyone and Plasma 6.3 is now out or it will be in a very short while and it's not the biggest version of Plasma we've seen since Plasma 6. In terms of the number of changes there's a lot but in terms of major features it's really not all that big. But what's interesting is that there's also a refreshed, let's call it official KD laptop coming out. So first we'll look at Plasma 6.3 and then we will look at this new laptop at the end of the video. So of course, if you don't want to watch that, you can end the video after the 6.3 review. And of course, we can't also start this video without a sponsor. This video is sponsored by Proton Mail. You know about them probably. You know that they offer a fully end-to-end -end encrypted and zero access encrypted email solution, but they also have a complete platform of services to do your calendar, your email, your contacts, your online storage, your password managers, and even your VPN all with one single account that cannot be accessed even by Proton employees. They've got all the features that you'd expect to protect your privacy, but also to help you actually do your job. And while the base account is free, they of course have paid plans if you need more storage and more features. Proton Mail is what I use for all my personal email, calendar and contacts, and I've been using them for more than a year now. I'm very, very happy with the service. And if you want to take advantage of all of this privacy and all of these features, the link is in the description. Okay, so first, let's start with the desktop itself. So the first thing that you'll notice, or maybe not because it's a small one, is all the close buttons that appear everywhere in Plasma have the exact same standardized style, meaning you will get that little black X or black cross. There are no little red X buttons or anything, even for notifications. It's the same style everywhere. There is another visual change, which is in the tabs department. Every time there are non-movable tabs, tabs that you can drag and drop everywhere, they are going to use this new style. Some KDE applications might not have switched just yet because, well, they need to update to the latest KDE frameworks, but most of the default apps that Plasma ship have this new style. Now, technically, the Breeze Dark theme is supposed to be darker and more contrasted. This on the left is KD 6.2, this on the right is 6.3. And honestly, I cannot really tell a difference. 6.2 even kind of feels darker in the window Chrome, but maybe just a little less dark in the window content. Really hard to say, I can't really notice this change personally. Now, one small change you might notice is that when you have multiple applications in the task list and you have a little plus sign to tell you that these apps have been grouped, well, this plus sign will now react to your accent color. It's no longer just blue, it will be following your accent color. Very small touch, but nice to see. Now, in terms of visual, that's about it. But in terms of other changes, there are a few cool ones. Uh, first, if you have multiple instances of the same widget, you can now remove them all with just one click from the widget panel, uh, which is pretty nice because if you have spawned a lot of nodes, for example, and you want to get rid of them, you don't have to remove them individually. Now in the edit mode, the various panel visualizations are now a bit clearer. If you hover over things and you start moving things around, you will notice that these little images here are now a bit more clear and a bit easier to understand. You also have an option to immediately clone a panel with one single button, which is of course very nice. And the edit mode itself has been cleaned up. Uh, you'll notice that that toolbar has a lot less things in it because it's been grouped in various buttons or removed when it didn't make sense. Now the little dialogue that shows when you're trying to switch to an entire new Plasma theme has been revamped just a little bit again. Uh, not that much, but it's now more in line with what's uh, added everywhere else in KDE. The main menu that is shipped with KDE also switched their category view by being click only before you could just over them to switch them, but this led to issues. I know they've been going back and forth on this for a while, but they've now elected to just make you click on them. If you don't like this, you can switch it by just hovering. You'll also notice that there is no longer a settings category. Everything that was in the settings has been uh, moved directly to system because it just made more sense. And there's a new help category. There are also improvements on the desktop to fractional scaling uh, on Wayland specifically. 
it should result in a lot less blurriness. Even at fractional scaling factors, the fonts should now be much crisper and everything should just work better. And also, KDE Plasma will better auto-detect the various uh, fractional scaling factor that they should use on smaller screens, and they will set this by increments of 5% not 25%, meaning it will always be much, much closer by default on devices that might have a high resolution, but a very small screen where sometimes things could be just enormous. You'll also notice there is another option here for color accuracy. You can decide to prefer efficiency, which is the system will be faster at the expense of color accuracy, or you can prefer color accuracy at the expense of system performance. Presumably it can have a large impact, but I don't exactly know how much. So there's nothing huge in terms of the desktop changes itself. It's a lot of small touches here and there. Uh, you also have widgets getting a bit more translucent when you put them on the desktop and a few changes like that. But visually, nothing really changed. And functionally, you don't have a lot in the Plasma experience. Now let's move on to applications and settings. So first, Discover will now show you verified applications, just like you can have on Flathub and on other sources, apps that are verified will now show a little tick mark when they've been packaged by their original developer or by a trusted third party. So what's interesting is that it doesn't just show this tick mark for Flathub apps and Flatpak applications, it also shows it for repos in certain distros. For example, here in KDE Neon, it's assumes that the person packaging the software for Ubuntu is a trusted third party. So that's nice because it brings this feature to virtually every kind of distro, although sometimes it can be pretty vague because you get software unverified by unknown source because the package is apparently from an unknown source here. Discover can also open all the Flatpak colon slash slash links online. So if you click on a website on the link that redirects you to a Flatpak package, Discover will be able to open it. Now, when updating applications that handle permissions, for example, with Flatpaks, you will see which permissions have changed before applying the update. I can't show it to you in the updates tab because I already applied all updates like an idiot. Uh, but yeah, you'll see it here. And the links section in Discover has also been revamped. This is the older one in 6.2, the new one in 6.3. It's a very minor change, but it's much more legible. You lose the little header and the icons are smaller. It's, it's more elegant, but it won't change how you use your system. In the system monitor of KDE, Flatpak applications that might have multiple instances or multiple windows will now no longer show multiple entries. They will have multiple entries in the processes list, but in the applications list, they will all be grouped. Another small change to the Plasma desktop is that the spectacle screenshot tool is now part of the Plasma desktop itself, not of the KDE gear compilation. So this thing will be updated with every version of Plasma, not independently, which makes sense. Like it's a core part of the desktop experience. Again, that's it for the apps, apart from Spectacle joining the roster of default apps inside of the Plasma desktop. So again, very few changes. There are a lot of bug fixes and very small UI improvements, but in terms of the major stuff that you'll see, that's about it. Now, in terms of the settings, a lot of stuff has changed for graphics, tablets, and drawing. Uh, I will rely on screenshots here because I don't have any hardware to try that on, but you can now elect to map an area of the drawing tablet to the entire screen's area, where previously you could only do the opposite. You could map a screen area to the entire tablet's surface. You can also now customize the pressure curve of styluses, and you can also customize the pressure range by completely dropping certain super high pressures or super low ones. And you can also swap the functions between buttons of your stylus. Now in the settings as well, if you create KWIN rules or window rules, previously you could either create it and it was applied or you had to delete it to remove it. Now you can elect to just disable it, but it's not deleted. So you can keep them in the settings without having to remove them or delete them every time, which is a nice change. In the list of the desktop effects, every desktop effect that requires you to use a shortcut will have this little sentence at the end activated with a keyboard shortcut. So you don't expect it to work all the time and you know to click on the configure button to actually set 
this specific keyboard shortcut that you might want to use. Something you might not even have known existed, but you could double click on uh, either the vertical or horizontal edge of a window to maximize it horizontally or vertically. You can now disable this behavior if you don't like it, although I never triggered it accidentally and I didn't even know it existed. But now you have an option to do so. The info center is now able to show you the battery cycle count and it will also show you all the GPUs that you have in your computer, not just the active one. And they also have nice little colored tags to show you what is an integrated GPU and what is a discrete GPU. You will also have a new page in this info center showing you information that has been grabbed from the EDID blocks of your display if anything was available. And you also have a bunch of other options like being able to disable the touchpad when a mouse is connected or the usual little touch-ups here and there in various pages to bring them more in line with a more recent visual style in KD, like all the new tabs or new dialogues. But in general, it's just makeovers and touch-ups and no real big features in there. So yeah, as you can see, it's a pretty small version of KD compared to what we're used to. There are no big changes or big refinements apart from if you use a graphics tablet and a stylus, in which case you're going to be very happy with this one. But for everyone else, it is definitely not a must have mandatory upgrade. It's nice to have if your distro offers it, but if not, you won't be sad to wait. And so as Plasma 6.3 was released, they also now have a, let's say, official new laptop, which is the KDE Slimbook. I think it's the sixth edition of this one, but this time it's a brand new chassis. It is not at all the same older chassis that they used, so we're going to take a look at that as well. So first, it's all made out of aluminium instead of the magnesium alloy that was used to make the previous one. This isn't a KD Slimbook, but it's the exact same device with a different logo, and it tended to scratch a bit more easily. This one will be much more resilient to that. Also, you'll notice it's a nice blue grayish finish, which I really like. With minimal branding, you've got that Slimbook logo underneath the screen here, and you've got the KD Slimbook logo on the back of the device and that's it. It weighs 1.85 kilos or 4.1 pounds, which means that yes, it is going to be heavier than the previous iteration and heavy for a laptop in general, but it's a 16 inch device, so it's understandable. It also runs KDE Neon, which is definitely not my favorite KDE distribution of all time, but it's the only one the KDE project really has currently. There's work ongoing to build something called KDE OS, which will be much more user focused. But for now, it's Neon. But of course, the laptop supports any type of Linux distro, so you can slap anything that runs KDE on that. You don't have to stick with Neon if you don't like it. Now, this thing is powered by a Ryzen 7 8845HS. You don't have a choice of CPU, it's this one. It's an 8 core, 16 thread CPU that can go up to 5.1 gigahertz is very powerful. It also comes with its integrated graphics. It's a Radeon 780M. It's no slouch. It will absolutely let you play a bunch of games or do some graphics intensive tasks. Don't expect it to even reach like RDX 40, 50 performance levels, but it's still pretty good for an integrated graphics chip, much better than anything Intel produces. In terms of build quality, it's one of the better built laptops I've handled. Nothing creaks, nothing bends, nothing moves around, and you definitely feel that the laptop is very rigid. The hinge is very strong, it doesn't wobble at all, and generally I love the look of this thing. It feels like a very premium device, much, much nicer feeling than the previous one, which was already pretty cool. In terms of ports, you have one HDMI port on the left with two USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 ports, both of which support DisplayPort 1.4 and power delivery. And on the right side, you get two USB-A 3.2 Gen 1 plus a microphone jack. You also have a very small barrel charger port on the left, but the laptop supports USB-C charging, so probably everyone will use that instead unless you absolutely need all the horsepower the laptop can deliver and you don't have a powerful enough USB-C charger. The display is absolutely gorgeous, 16 inches, a resolution of 2560 by 1600 at 120 hertz. It's 16 by 10, which is a good aspect ratio, and it has an anti-glare coating on top that does its job properly. It is color accurate, it's vibrant, it's a really, really good display. 
Now, unfortunately, you get a really terrible webcam above this display. It's only 720p. It looks really bad. The mic is also terrible. Please, it's 2025 laptop manufacturers. Everyone works from home. Please include semi-decent video conferencing hardware in your laptops. A decent mic, a decent webcam. It's the bare minimum. Now, the good thing is that neither the RAM or the SSD are soldered inside this laptop, so you can swap to whatever you want. By default, it comes with 16 gigs of DDR5 RAM and 500 gigs of PCIe 3 storage, although it supports PCIe 4. And this entry-level model sells for 1100 euros with the 20% VAT included. So it's really not that pricey for this kind of quality and those specs. Now, in terms of the inputs, uh, the touchpad is super smooth on that laptop, very precise. It works really well for touchpad gestures. It also offers a very nice click and it doesn't rattle in place at all, which is always nice. Nothing makes a laptop feel super cheap instantly than when you press down on the touchpad and it moves slightly to the right or the left. Well, that's not the case here. The keyboard is also very nice. It is a bit shallow in terms of key travel for my taste but you even get a crunched numpad on the right, which I think is good because it's small enough not to disturb people who don't like these. It doesn't occupy the full space of a numpad, but it's also large enough to be of use for people like me who love having access to that kind of stuff. The only downside for me at least is the not centered touchpad, which as always, I really do not like aesthetically. And it also causes shoulder pain because I have to move my, my right arm a bit further than I'd like. It's just not good. Interestingly, Slimbook absolutely doesn't limit the power consumption that the CPU can have. So you have direct function keys that you can use to switch between profiles. And if you go to the max performance profile, you actually let the CPU run wild and use every single watt of power it wants, which is nice. Of course, that will be at the expense of battery life, but you do have an 80 watt hour battery inside of that thing. And you don't have a discrete GPU, meaning it is rated to last up to 12 hours. In my experience, using Firefox, watching videos in a browser in a loop over Wi-Fi at mid-brightness, I got more eight and a half hours. But I think that if you really stretch uh, the display, you limit it to 60 hertz, you really reduce the brightness, you disable internet and you work locally, yes, you might be able to hit those 12 hours. I think in real use scenarios, it's more like eight, eight and a half tops. Now, if you like this specific model of computer, but you don't necessarily like the KDE branding, Slimbook also sells a version called the Excalibur, which does not have that branding. But if you buy the KDE version, you help support the KDE Plasma project. A part of the profits go to KDE. And that laptop is actually developed in collaboration between Slimbook and KDE as usual. Now, I've owned and used a similar model to what the KDE Slimbook used to be, which was a decent laptop, it worked well. I still use it quite often to review certain distros and I felt it was a good one. But when you put it side by side with this new one, full aluminum, much better keyboard, much better touchpad, good screen, 16 inches, which I like. And of course the much better performance because well, much newer internals. This one makes the older one look like absolute trash and that's kind of fun. So this one, really, really good laptop. I didn't spend a ton of time with it, but I do really like the device. It would not suit my own needs because it doesn't have a discrete GPU and I need that uh, for Resolve and for gaming. But if you don't and you like KDE and you want a 16 inch laptop that runs Linux, at 1100 euros, you could do worse, especially since you will get Plasma 6.3 in there, even though it's kind of a minor release. Anyway, this will conclude this video. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, you have plenty of links in the description to help support the channel. You know where all the usual YouTube buttons are. Click them if you want the channel to grow. And in the meantime, I guess you'll see me in the next one this week. Bye.